So hello everybody, welcome back. Um, today we're gonna continue on with our chapter nine lecture on momentum. And just to quickly recap the topics that we've touched on up until this point. First, we defined what momentum is. And then second, we showed how it's related to force, which is a really important relationship. Um, then we talked about this idea of conservation of momentum. And that's where we ended last time. We haven't really yet touched on any examples. So that's really the focus of today's lecture is to do plenty of examples so you know how you can use this idea of conservation of momentum in a lot of different uh, contexts. So the classic example that we're gonna see with um, conservation of momentum is a two body collision. So here's the scenario that I want you to think about. We have two objects, A and B, and they simply collide with each other. So what we wanna do is use conservation of momentum to relate how these two objects are moving before they collide to how they're moving after they collide because we might wanna predict how things move after they collide. So the setup is this. The initial velocities of the two objects, we're gonna call those VA and VB. So that's before they collide, uh, those are our initial velocities. Now after the two objects collide and they've moved off in some new way, um, we have final velocities, VA prime and VB prime. Okay, so that would be the final state of the system after they collide. So if we have a situation where we look at A and B together as a system, and there is zero net external force acting on that system, then we know that the total momentum of A and B is gonna be conserved. That's one really important result that we found uh, in the last lecture. So when momentum is conserved, the way we'll typically write this is P initial is equal to P final, meaning the momentum isn't changing, the final and initial values are the same thing. So in this case, uh, the initial momentum of the system is MA VA plus MB VB. We just have to add up the two momentum vectors for the two objects. The final momentum is MA VA prime plus MB VB prime. And again, we can set those equal to each other because momentum is conserved. So that's really the equation that we're gonna use for a two body collision to relate how things move before and how things move after the collision. So let's start with an example. Um, the simplest possible example of this that we can see is a two body collision in one dimension. So this means all the motion is just happening along a single line. Uh, it's not more complicated than that. So two pucks, M1 is 45 grams, M2 is 35 grams, are on a level frictionless air hockey table. Initially, puck one is at rest and puck two is sliding towards puck one with a speed of 2.45 meters per second. Okay, the pucks then collide head on. After the collision, puck two moves in the same direction but at a reduced speed of 1.05 meters per second. What is the speed of puck one after collision? Okay, so the diagram at the bottom of the slide here really kind of spells out what's going on. Before collision, it's just puck two moving. And then after a collision, they're both moving. And what we wanna do is use conservation of momentum to predict how fast puck number one is moving after the collision. So the first thing to note is, can we use conservation of momentum in this situation? Well, the answer is yes, because there is no friction on this table. It's perfectly flat, so they're not gonna be pulled down uh, an incline or anything like that. If we look at puck one and two as a system, there is no external force acting on that system. And because of that, we can apply conservation of momentum. So let's work out what the final speed of puck one is using conservation of momentum. Okay, so this is a pretty straightforward example of a two body collision. And what's happening is in the initial state, we have the second object approaching the first object, which is starting off stationary. And in the final state, after they collide, uh, we have the second object and the first object both moving to the right. So the, the notation here is we're going to say V1 and V2 are the initial velocities and V1 prime and V2 prime are the final velocities. Here, what we're attempting to find is V1 prime. Now, let's set up a little coordinate system here where the positive X direction is going to the right and the positive Y direction is up. Um, that's what we're going to use to refer to our directions. And if momentum is conserved here, we have P initial equals P final 
for this system of two pucks. Now, the initial momentum of the system can be written as m1 times v1 plus m2 times v2 equals m1 v1 prime plus m2 v2 prime. Okay, so the initial momentum of the two pucks added together right here, final momentum right over here, they're equal, momentum is conserved. First thing we can do is note that v1, which represents the starting velocity of puck one, is zero, so that first term just goes away. And if we want to solve for uh, v1 prime, maybe the first thing we should do is subtract m2 v2 prime, this term, from both sides of the equation. So we get m1 v1 prime equals m2 v2, which is right here, uh, minus m2 v2 prime, again, when we subtract this term. To solve for v1 prime, here's what we get. We have m2 divided by m1, and then we're going to take v2 minus v2 prime. That's what we need to calculate right there. <clears throat> so um, the two masses are, uh, let's write this over here, 35 grams is m2, and 45 grams is m1. Now, the units of grams just immediately cancel. In the parentheses, we have v2, which is the initial velocity of this guy. Um, that, if we write it as a vector, is 2.45 meters per second i-hat, because it's going completely in the positive x direction. But then we're subtracting v2 prime, which is the final velocity of that second object, and uh, that's going to be 1.05 meters per second, and then also i-hat, because again, we're talking about the positive x direction. So this isn't so bad. We have calculation to make here. And what it comes down to is 1.088. Keep three sig figs in this calculation, and the units are meters per second, and that i-hat unit vector is still coming along. What is this telling us? This is telling us that uh, after the collision, puck number one is moving at a speed of 1.09 meters per second, if we round this off, uh, to the right. So it's just moving in the same direction uh, to the right. So for a follow-up example, um, let's consider the same exact scenario that we saw earlier, where we have two pucks colliding on a table. But in this case, we want to think of a collision between these two objects in two dimensions. So that just means the motion all isn't all in the x direction, uh, it's in the x and the y direction, and we have to consider um, the x and y motions together. So consider the same two pucks from the previous problem. Initially, puck one is at rest, and puck two is sliding towards puck one with an initial speed of 2.45 meters per second. So if you look at the, the diagram, the before collision picture looks pretty much the same, but notice it's not hitting head on anymore. It's kind of, puck two is kind of hitting puck one on the side, which means after collision, puck two is gonna move uh, with a speed of 1.05 meters per second, but at an angle of 25 degrees as shown below. So puck number two is no longer just moving straight along the x-axis, it's moving uh, at an angle of 25 degrees as you see in the after collision picture. Now, our question that we need to answer is, what is the speed of puck one? and what direction is it moving in? So once again, we're gonna use conservation of momentum. That really hasn't changed. It's just now that we have to really be careful to uh, make sure we treat everything as a vector because this collision is in two dimensions. Okay, so this is a slightly more complex example because now we have a two body collision, but it's happening in two dimensions, meaning we have to think about the X as well as the Y motion that's occurring. So let's look at this. Initially, uh, we have puck number two moving to the right, just like before, towards a stationary puck number one. But then afterwards, puck number two is moving down and to the right a little bit. It's in the fourth quadrant, whereas uh, puck number one, we don't know its velocity at all. That's the point of this, is we're going to find out what that velocity is. So we're going to use conservation of momentum, like before, 
where p initial is equal to p final. Okay, so that means m1 v1 uh, plus m2 v2 equals m1 v1 prime plus m2 v2 prime, just like before. All right, so what we want to do is go ahead and solve for v1 prime. I'm going to skip a few steps here because everything about this is exactly like the previous problem. If I want to solve for v1 prime, remember v1 is zero, so cross that out, then try to isolate v1 prime on one side of the equation, and just like before, here's what you get. m2 divided by m1 times v2 minus m2 divided by m1 times v2 prime. Okay, so I skipped a few steps, but it's just like the previous problem. That's where we get this result. Now, what I'm going to do is plug in these numbers. So for m2 over m1, well, that's that same ratio of 35 divided by 45 that we had previously. But I'm going to take that and multiply by v2, which is, again, the initial velocity of puck number 2. Well, that hasn't changed. It's just moving in the x direction at 2.45 meters per second initially. So I'd write this as a vector, 2.45 meters per second i hat. And last time we didn't really write this, but it's useful to do it now. We can write 0 j hat. So this is the x component, 2.45. There is no y component. That's how you can think about it. Go ahead and subtract this, which is m2 over m1, 35.0 over 45. Okay, But now, um, v2 prime is a little different from before. It has both an x and a y component. So we want to be a little bit careful about how we make this calculation. It's moving with a speed of 1.05 meters per second. That would be the magnitude of the vector. But if I want the x component, what I need to do is take that magnitude and multiply it by cosine of the angle. Now, the angle we were given here was 25 degrees, but below the x-axis going this way. So to get this right, I'm going to consider this a negative angle, negative 25 degrees. And again, we have the i hat unit vector coming along for this. OK, now I think I'm going to run out of space, but bear with me. We're going to have the y component of this vector, which is 1.05 meters per second. We have to multiply that by sine of that same minus 25 degree angle. Okay, let's slightly move this. Sine of negative 25 degrees, j hat. Okay, so this is all one term here. I just had to use the space that I have. Okay, so we're going to get the resultant vector of this uh, by taking, again, 35 over 45 times 2.45, subtract 35 over 45 times 1.5 times cosine negative 25 degrees. That's the calculation to do. So we get an x component, and we get a y component out of this calculation. Again, the x component, as I just said, uh, is 1.165, keep three sig figs, meters per second. If I want to get the y component, well, I just take 0 minus 35 over 45 times 1.5 times sine of negative 25. And that works out to positive point uh, three four five one keep three sig figs meters per second so what did we just find for v1 prime the final velocity of the first puck we know what its velocity is in x y form which means we're almost there the last thing to do is convert this to a magnitude and a direction okay so to do that, um, I'm going to leave just the bottom uh, there because we want to know those x and y components. And I'm going to erase the rest. And then I'm just going to label 
what we have here. This is the x component of my vector uh, v1 prime. So I'll call this v1 prime x right there. This one is the y component of that same vector, v1 prime y. Now, I want to know the speed, which is the magnitude of v1 prime. So again, the way this works is we take the square root of v1 prime x squared plus v1 prime y squared. That's the magnitude of the vector. So v1 prime x is 1.165 meters per second. Go ahead and square that. Add to it uh, 0.3451 meters per second. Square it. And then put all of that under the radical. Like this. OK. Calculate the speed. Um, this comes out to about 1.215. We're going to keep three sig figs. So that would be 1.22 meters per second. All right. So that's the magnitude, or the speed. The angle, which gives us the direction, um, well, if I have a vector with these x and y components, remember how this works. The tangent of the angle that my vector makes with the x-axis is equal to v1y prime over v1x prime. So just, again, y over x is what I'm really talking about here. So what quadrants are we in when it comes to this vector? It's, well, it's the first quadrant. We have two uh, positive components for x and y. So that means we can just straightforwardly take tangent inverse of y over x, 0.345 over 1.165. We're doing the inverse tangent. And the inverse tangent works out to 16.5 degrees. So after the collision, puck 1 is moving at 1.22 meters per second. It's moving at an angle of 16.5 degrees. So as a follow-up to the, the last two we did, here's a question for the class. So again, when we uh, state the question, just pause the video, see if you can come up with an answer, and then we'll go through it. The question says, if the pucks from the previous two questions were on a tilted table instead of a level table, would their total momentum still be conserved in that case? So think about it, pause the video, and then uh, we'll go through the answer. So here, here's what we should think about. If we have these two pucks, one and two, uh, and they're on a tilted table, we can identify all the different forces acting on these two pucks. So the, the most obvious one would be weight, right? Uh, there's a force of gravity acting on puck two uh, that's going straight down. There's also uh, a force because they're, the two pucks are touching each other. So puck one exerts a force on puck two, and that's going up the incline. And then also, uh, there's a normal force that the table exerts on puck two. And that's not going to go straight up anymore. That's going to go perpendicular to the actual surface of the incline. Okay. Then if we go on to puck one, there's also a force of gravity. So there's a weight force. Um, there's also a force that two exerts on one. Remember, F12, F21, those are equal and opposite forces. And then finally, we have the normal force that the table exerts on puck one. Now, we're going to indicate the equal and opposite force pairs with a little slash, as we always do. But what I really want you to think about is, if we define the system as the two pucks, what is the external force, the total external force acting on that system? So remember, um, F12 and F21, those would be considered internal, because those are forces that the pucks are exerting on each other. But the normal forces are coming from the table, and the weight is coming from the earth, so those would be our external forces. So if I wanted to add up all the external forces, I would add NT2, WE2, NT1, and WE1. So again, the two normal forces and the weights, just add all those together. That's the total external force. Now, if we were on a flat table, then the normal forces would just cancel out the weights, and 
we'd get zero. But in this case, uh, the normal force doesn't cancel out the weight, so we don't get zero. In fact, if you work out the net force, it's going down the incline. It's not zero. So if the net external force acting on this system isn't zero, we actually can't use conservation of momentum. And this should make sense if you think about it, because these two pucks are accelerating down the incline. They're not just going to have a constant momentum. Their momentum is going to increase as they accelerate down the incline. So we can't use conservation of momentum in this case. Okay. Let's follow this up with a couple questions for you to work on at home. Um, this one says, we have a train car initially traveling at 40 meters per second, which approaches three identical coupled train cars. And those are initially at rest. The moving train car hitches to the stationary train cars, and then they all move off together. What is their final speed? Assume that momentum is conserved. Okay, so pause the video, see if you can figure this one out, and then we'll go through it. Okay, so in this problem involving the uh, train cars, the initial situation looks something like this. We actually don't know the um, individual masses of the train cars, so we don't know what the mass of each one is, but we do know that they all have the same mass, which is the only thing we actually need to know. So let's call big M the mass of one of the train cars. So we have big M moving at velocity V initially towards 3M, okay, because we have three train cars right here, and they're initially not moving at all. In the final state, we have 4M, so four train cars are moving all together at some velocity v prime, and our job is to find v prime. So this one's not too bad. If we apply conservation of momentum and say p initial is equal to p final, here's what comes of that. Initially, the only moving object is this one train car. Its mass is m, and its velocity is v. So just m times v, that's the initial momentum, that's it. Our final momentum is, now we have four train car masses, so 4m, and they're moving at velocity v prime. So let's cancel out that mass, it doesn't matter what it is, and just solve for v prime. v prime is 1 fourth v. Okay, so this makes logical sense. If you think about the idea of conservation of momentum, what we've just done here is we've increased the mass effectively that's moving by a factor of four. Okay, and if momentum is mass times velocity, and we've increased the mass by a factor of four, that means velocity has to go down by a factor of four if momentum is gonna stay the same. That's just what we found here. So the velocity V here, representing the incoming velocity of that first train car, was 10, uh, sorry, 40 meters per second, I hat, just moving to the right, and, um, Okay, so a fourth of 40 is 10 meters per second I hat. So again, cut down by a factor of four. So as a follow-up to that last one, uh, let's think about this question. It's the same initial situation. We have a train car initially traveling at 40 meters per second, which approaches three identical coupled train cars, which are initially at rest. The moving train car bounces off the stationary train cars with a final speed of 20 meters per second in the opposite direction. What is the final speed of the three coupled train cars? Again, we're assuming momentum is conserved. So in this case, rather than everything hitching together and you have one object moving off um, in the final state, uh, the, the train car that came in at 40 meters per second is now bouncing off in the other direction. So let's see how this changes the answer compared to what we got before. Okay, so this is a slight variation on the previous problem where again, we have the same single train car coming in uh, towards these three stationary train cars. So this time I'm just gonna put a number, 40 meters per second I hat is that starting velocity. Then instead of all hitching together, this one bounces back it's moving to the left now at 20 meters per second. So as a vector, I could write this as negative 20 meters per second I hat just to indicate that the direction has reversed. Then these three train cars over here are now moving forward uh, in uh, the positive direction. 
with some velocity v prime. So my job is to find v prime. The same exact uh, principle is being used here, conservation of momentum, or p initial is equal to p final. And um, initially, our momentum, just like before, is this mass. Uh, here, let me write this on the next line. It's this mass, m, times this velocity, which is 40 meters per second, i hat. This one's not moving, so there's no momentum to account for that. In the final state, now we have that same mass. It's moving at negative 20 meters per second i hat for its velocity. And then we have 3m moving at velocity v prime. That's how we think about this. So the total momentum of these two in the final state is written as we just uh, put it down here. Now the mass of an individual train car, that can be canceled out. Doesn't matter what that is, it goes away. So if I add this term, if I add 20 meters per second i hat to both sides, now over here, I'm going to have 60 meters per second times i hat. And on this side, I'm going to be left with 3 times v prime. So if I want to know what v prime is, I better divide by 3. 60 divided by 3 is 20. 20 meters per second i hat. So what's happening is these three train cars move to the right at 20 meters per second, and this single train car bounces back to the left at 20 meters per second. And then here's another one. Um, this one isn't a collision, but it's another case where we can use conservation of momentum, uh, and it involves a bomb exploding into multiple fragments, and those fragments moving in different directions. So here's what we have. A bomb, which is initially at rest, explodes into three fragments. Immediately after the explosion, one of the fragments, which is 25% of the bomb's mass, travels due north at uh, 250 meters per second. Another fragment, which is 50% of the bomb's total mass, travels in a direction 35 degrees south of west at 350 meters per second. What is the velocity of the third fragment immediately after the explosion? we're gonna give the magnitude and direction of that velocity. So we'll assume momentum is conserved. Okay, so just to think about this real quick, in the initial state, we have a single object, which is a bomb, and it's at rest. In the final state, that bomb has now uh, fragmented into three pieces, and they're all moving off in different directions. But it's really important to note that momentum is conserved. So the total momentum of the bomb in the initial state is equal to the total momentum of these three fragments in the final state. So use that to figure out uh, how fast and in what direction the third fragment is moving. So we'll work this one out. Okay, so in this problem, we have a bomb that explodes into multiple fragments. And the first thing I want to think about here is what is the initial momentum of this system? Well, if the bomb started off at rest, then the initial momentum of the system is just zero, right? Because if we have a single object that's not moving, uh, well, that system has no momentum. Now, because momentum is conserved, I know that P final is equal to P initial. And if P initial is zero, that means p final is also zero. So the way I think about p initial again is you just have a bomb sitting there not moving. How do you think about p final? Well, you have these three different fragments that are moving off in different directions. But apparently, the total momentum of those three fragments has to be zero. In other words, their momentum vectors all cancel each other out. That's how you think of it. So let's sketch out what's going on with the three fragments. The first thing is um, that we have a fragment going due north, and that is a quarter, or 25%, of the total mass of the bomb. So if we let big M represent the total mass, this would be M over 4. We were told that this piece is moving with velocity, let's call it V1, but it's pointing due north. Okay. The next fragment, we were told that this is a half of the total mass, so let's put that as M over 2 is moving 
at an angle 35 degrees south of west. So, okay, let's, let's actually put a coordinate system on this picture just so we're all straight. Um, so the x direction, as we typically do, is going to represent east, whereas the y direction is going to represent north. So this angle is 35 degrees south of west, okay, because this line is west going to the left. If we go down 35 degrees from there, that's going south. So this is what we call 35 degrees south of west. All right, that velocity is, we'll call V2. Okay, now what's left? We have a third fragment, and if this is half of the mass, this is a quarter of the mass. The last one also has to have a quarter of the mass. And we actually don't really know in particular which way this uh, velocity vector should be pointing. We do know that these momentum vectors have to cancel out, so we kind of have some sense it's going to the right a little bit, but we don't know exactly. Let's just draw something that's kind of in the right ballpark and say that's V3. We're trying to figure out what V3 is. Okay, so P final, got these three different pieces. Um, the first piece has mass m divided by four. And to get the momentum of that piece, we would multiply by v1. My second piece has mass m divided by two and multiply by v2 to get the momentum of that second piece. Add that to m divided by four multiplied by v3 and that's the momentum of the third piece. And again, this all has to equal zero. The final momentum, which is these three components added together, is going to be zero. All right, so to simplify this a little bit, what I want to do is on both sides of the equation, multiply by four divided by m. So if I do that on the right side, I'm just taking zero times four divided by m. So I still have zero. Over here, if I take 4 divided by m, that exactly cancels this fraction, so I'm just left with v1. Over here, if I multiply by 4 over m, uh, then I'm just going to be left with 2, v2. And then here, again, if I multiply by 4 over m, I just am left with uh, v3. So it's just a way of simplifying the equation. It looks a little nicer. Keep in mind, we're trying to find v3 in this problem. So v3, if we just push the other two terms to the other side by subtracting, uh, we solve for v3, it's minus v1, uh, minus v1 minus 2v2. Okay, there it is. That's what we need to calculate to get v3. So let's do it. v3. So What's V1? It's only going in the y direction. It's going due north. So if I write it as a vector in x, y form, I'd say zero i hat, there's no x component. And the y component is 250 meters per second j hat. Okay, so that's V1. Again, I have to do negative V1, so I put the negative sign out front. Then we have minus 2v2. I want to have a, a negative 2 out here. And then in the brackets, I'm just going to write v2 in xy form. Okay, um, let's think about this a little more carefully. If the angle right here is uh, 35 degrees south of west, what's my angle off the positive x-axis? Well, if I start here and then I go here, I'm at 180, so if I'm starting east and then I'm at west, I'm at 180. But then I have to go another 35 degrees to get to this vector. So I have 215. Okay, so this is the angle off the positive x axis. So we're going to use that. Um, the magnitude of this vector v2 is 350 meters per second. 
So if we take that by, and multiply by cosine of 215, that's going to give us the x component. Similarly, if we take 350 times sine of 215, okay, that'll be j hat, uh, that will give us the y component. Okay, so to solve for v3, we've got 0 minus 2 times 350 times cosine 215. That's going to give me the x component. Let's work it out. That comes to 573.4 meters per second. Okay, to get the y component, I'm going to have minus 250 minus 2 times 350 times sine of 215. That's what you'd punch into your calculator. That comes out to um, 151.5. And the units here are meters per second. Okay, so this is V3x. This is V3y. In other words, the x and y components of this velocity vector that we're ultimately trying to find. Okay. So we're almost done. The only thing we have left to do is to rewrite this V3, not in XY form, but in terms of a magnitude and a direction. So we've got the X and Y components right down there. Let's remember what to do next. Magnitude V3, square root. V3x squared plus V3y squared. That's how you take the magnitude of any vector. Let's plug in the numbers. We're going to have uh, 573.4. You can tell I'm about to run out of space, so I'm going to leave the units off. Actually, no, I'll put them right here. Meters per second. Okay. Um, then, for the y component, we have... 151.5, square it, meters per second. Calculate that, and here's what you'll find. This works out to 593 meters per second. So we know that third fragment of the bomb is traveling this fast after it explodes. 593 meters per second. Okay, so the angle then, look, we already know how this works. It's the inverse tangent of v3y over v3x. And again, this is going to tell me which direction uh, this third fragment is moving in. So by the way, we don't have to add 180 or anything like that because this vector is in the first quadrant. So uh, for y, we have 151.5. For x, we have 573.4. Take that ratio, take the inverse tangent, and what you'll get is about 14.8 uh, degrees. Okay, so that's the angle we're moving at uh, after this bomb explodes. Um, so hopefully you see uh, how we can utilize this idea of conservation of momentum to solve different types of problems. The next thing I'd like to talk about is types of collisions. So the idea here is um, when things collide, there are multiple ways that can happen. And we call these elastic and inelastic collisions. Let's get into what this means. Now, to really understand elastic and inelastic collisions, you really need to be introduced to this idea of energy. Now, energy is actually a pretty tricky concept in physics. And my intention is not to really dive too deep into it in this class, when you take physics 45, we'll really study energy in detail. Um, but for now, let's just say a few things about energy. Now, energy is something that comes in many different forms. But overall, energy is a conserved quantity. So that just means whatever happens, energy on the whole will stay the same. Let's talk about uh, some of the forms of energy um, that we can have. So kinetic energy is one example. 
elastic potential energy is another. That means if you stretch a rubber band or you compress a spring, uh, you'll have some elastic potential energy. Gravitational potential energy, that just has to do with how high off the ground something is. Um, and then nuclear energy. These are just a handful of examples. There are many, many more. But when we look at all these different uh, varieties of energy that you can have, um, and the fact that energy is conserved, well, energy can be transferred from one object to another. Okay, so let's say two objects collide with each other. Well, one of the objects can give some energy to the other in that collision. Also, energy can be converted from one type to another. For instance, you know, I can, I can take potential energy and convert it to kinetic energy, but on the whole, energy is something that is conserved and it stays the same. So I, I gave a lot to you just now. So let's kind of uh, zoom back in at what we're talking about here. For now, we just need to think about kinetic energy. Let's only focus our attention on kinetic energy. All of these other types you will get to in physics 45. So kinetic energy is the energy that's associated with the motion of an object. So something has kinetic energy because of the way it's moving. We can calculate it using this equation. K is equal to one half mv squared. That is how kinetic energy is defined. And m is just the mass of the object, v is the speed. So it's a very simple relationship. Kinetic energy just depends on the mass of the object and the speed, how fast it's moving. We do need to talk a little bit about units uh, before we go any further. So let's just take a quick note of the fact that the SI unit of kinetic energy is a joule and to see what this looks like, the SI unit of mass is a kilogram. So plug that in for M in the equation above. Uh, the SI unit of uh, speed is a meter per second. So again, plug that in for V in the equation above. And just unit wise, we're gonna have kilograms meters squared per second squared, okay? So that is the definition of a joule. That's how a joule as a unit of energy breaks down into kilograms, meters, and seconds, which are our base units uh, that we build everything up from in the SI system. So just to get a little bit of practice thinking about this idea of kinetic energy, especially if you haven't seen this before, let's do a couple simple calculations. So first, let's calculate how much kinetic energy does a 4.20 gram bullet have if it's traveling at 965 meters per second. Second, Let's calculate how much kinetic energy a 125 kilogram linebacker has if he's traveling at a speed of 6.5 meters per second. Okay, so now we have a couple examples just calculating kinetic energy um, using the formula kinetic energy is one half mass times speed squared. So the first example is a bullet that has a mass of 400, no, sorry, 4.20 grams and is moving at 965 meters per second. So in order for this to come out in joules, which is our SI unit of energy, we actually need to uh, convert the mass from grams to kilograms. So if I have 4.20 grams, that would be 4.20 times 10 to the minus three kilograms and I would take 965 meters per second, and then I would go ahead and square that. Okay, so this works out to, if we keep too many digits, 1,955.5-ish, but we're only keeping three sig figs. Also, let's look at the units. We have kilograms, we have meters squared, and we have seconds squared, okay, because we square this and we square that. And, well, round it off to 1,960, and then again recognize that we have joules here as our unit. Okay. Now let's look at the case of the linebacker. So a big football player with a mass of 125 kilograms that is traveling at uh, 6.5, 6.5 meters per second. So in this case, our kinetic energy is going to be a half. 125 kilograms, and then here we'll put 6.5 meters per second 
and we'll square that. Okay, so we don't have to go through this whole unit thing again. We know it's joules. And when we round off to the proper number of sig figs, we get 2,640 joules. Okay, so it may be surprising to see that uh, the linebacker has more kinetic energy than the bullet because, well, I don't know about you, but I'd, I'd rather get tackled by a linebacker than be hit with a bullet. Um, the reason, uh, even though this has more kinetic energy than the bullet, but the bullet is more dangerous, is that the bullet is uh, transferring that energy over a really, really small area. Whereas if you, let's say, get tackled by a linebacker, uh, that energy is being transferred over a much larger area. So it's a little bit uh, less dangerous. And now I want you guys to practice uh, with this idea of kinetic energy. Here's a question for the class. So here's what's going on in this problem. We have a 120 uh, kilogram linebacker who's running towards an 85 kilogram quarterback who's initially at rest um, and the linebacker is moving at 6.5 meters per second. Consider the tackle, so the linebacker is tackling the quarterback, consider that to be a head-on collision. Immediately after this collision, the linebacker and the quarterback are just moving together through the air with the same speed. Well, first, let's figure out what is this final speed. Uh, then we'll calculate what percentage of the initial kinetic energy of the linebacker is lost during this collision. Think about other forms of energy that this lost kinetic energy might have been converted into during the collision. Okay, so again, think about a collision between two people. Okay, calculate the kinetic energy before and after, and then figure out by what amount has it changed, by what percentage has your kinetic energy changed. Okay, so in this next problem, uh, the, the situation you should have in your mind, or the picture you should have in your mind, is an initial state, which is before there's a tackle, where the linebacker is moving towards the quarterback with some velocity, we'll call it V. Uh, the final situation after the tackle occurs is now they're both moving together at the same speed, okay, so the, the linebacker has uh, sort of grabbed on to the quarterback, and now they're just moving together through the air, with some velocity V prime, okay? That's what you should be thinking. Now, if we apply conservation of momentum to this system, P initial is equal to P final, uh, that comes down to, in the initial state, just having mass of the linebacker, let's call that ML, multiplied by V. That's the momentum here. There's no momentum over there, so that's it the quarterback is initially stationary. In the final state, what we have is, we'll think of this as the combined mass of ML plus MQ multiplying uh, V prime. So our job here is to figure out uh, V prime. We want to know how fast they're moving. So V prime looks like we can just take ML, divide out ML plus MQ, multiply by V, and we'll get our answer. What's the mass of the linebacker? It's 120 kilograms. What's the mass of the linebacker plus the quarterback? 120 plus 85 kilograms. And then finally, what's V? That was 6.5 meters per second. So let's work this out. Um, if you do the math, you should be getting 3.8 meters per second for the uh, final velocity here. Okay, so now that we have that, we can go a step further. We can start calculating kinetic energy. So K initial, let's let that be the uh, initial kinetic energy of our system. Again, we have only one object moving, that's the linebacker, quarterback is not moving. So we only have to think about this kinetic energy which is one half mass of the linebacker, because we have to use the mass of that one alone, times V squared, the speed of this one. So then we have a half uh, times 120 kilograms times 6.5 meters per second, and we square that. Now what this comes out to, if you do the math, is just about 2,500 
joules. Now in the final state for K final, we have one half. If I want to think of the linebacker and the quarterback together as a single moving object, I have to take the combined mass, ML plus MQ, just like before. And the speed is V prime, and we're going to square it. So now I have a half, okay, 120 plus 85 kilograms. Multiply that by 3.8 meters per second. That's our final speed we found over here, and square it. This comes out to about 1,500 joules. So the surprising thing is uh, the kinetic energy before the tackle is a lot more by about 1,000 joules than the kinetic energy after the tackle. So it looks like some kinetic energy has been lost. And to figure out exactly by how much, we can calculate a percent change. Okay, so, so the overall change in kinetic energy is K final minus K initial, which would be 1,500 minus 2,500 joules. If I divide that by what we started with, which is 2,500 joules, and then I multiply that by 100, I'll get that percent change. Now this comes out to about minus 40. Minus meaning we've lost kinetic energy relative to what we started with. Okay, so the last thing to get into here is if we think about the total kinetic energy of the linebacker plus the quarterback, and we see that it's less after the tackle than before the tackle, we have to ask the question where that energy has gone because energy never disappears. Energy is always conserved. So if, if kinetic energy is lost, it's being converted into some other type of energy. That's how it has to work. So let's ask, where would that energy go to? Well, first thing is, when you make a tackle, okay, it usually produces a pretty loud sound. So the fact that you hear a sound means energy is being uh, taken away from the system, is moving away from the system in the form of sound waves. Okay. Another thing is, in a collision between two objects, like a tackle, uh, heat can be generated. Again, that is another form of energy. Um, and the last thing is, when two football players collide, oftentimes um, a helmet will be cracked, or a pad will be deformed, or someone will even break a bone, like a rib. If any of those things happen, that takes energy. And that's just another place where this missing kinetic energy can go. So just one more example here. And the, the point that I'm trying to illustrate is when two objects collide, there, there's more than one way the collision can unfold. So if I know how the objects are moving before the collision, there are many different ways they could be moving after the collision. Uh, there's not just one way it could work. So to illustrate that point, let's consider two kilogram masses, which are initially sliding towards each other on a flat frictionless surface. Each one has a speed of one meter per second. Let's think about different ways they could possibly be moving after they collide each other, collide with each other. So we're, we're going to go uh, starting from the top and then work our way down. The, the first uh, case that I want us to see is, let's suppose the masses bounce off each other and they each move at one meter per second after the collision. So take a look at this animation. They're moving towards each other at one meter per second. They bounce off each other and now they're moving away from each other at one meter per second. Okay, so momentum is conserved in this collision, and actually no kinetic energy is lost, because if we take the total kinetic energy of the two objects before and the total kinetic energy of the two objects after the collision, we're going to find it's the same thing. So we'll, we'll do these calculations in just one second, but let's go on to the next example. This one involves two masses bouncing off each other, and after they collide, they're only moving at half a meter per second so this is what it looks like. They come in towards each other at one meter per second, but then they bounce off, moving slower at half a meter per second after they collide. So what we're going to find when we do some calculations is that, of course, momentum is conserved here, but there is a little bit of kinetic energy being lost in this case. In fact, 0.75 joules of kinetic energy is lost. On the whole, the objects had more kinetic energy before they collided compared to after.
Okay, so we lost some. Now the third case at the bottom here that I want us to consider is the objects move towards each other, then they collide, but after that, they, they don't even move off separately. They just stick together at the point where they meet. And of course, that means they're both coming to a stop after the collision. If we do some calculations, we'll find that the momentum is conserved and all of that kinetic energy that we started with is now lost. Okay, so let's take a minute now to, to go through those calculations. How did I know uh, what these numbers were for these three different examples? Let's get into that. Okay, so to wrap this lecture up, um, what I want to do is give you a little insight into some of the calculations that were made to get the numbers in the previous uh, three examples. So first, let's think about um, example one, the first example on the slide, where we had these two objects um, both moving at one meter per second towards each other initially, and then bouncing off each other and moving at one meter per second in opposite directions afterwards. So if we think about the initial momentum of that system, that would be MA times VA plus MB times VB. And if we put in what we know, uh, MA is a kilogram, and it's initially moving to the right, so let's call that the positive direction at one meter per second put I hat there. Um, MB, that mass is also a kilogram, but it starts off moving to the left, so let's call that uh, the negative direction, minus one meter per second uh, I hat. Now, this pretty clearly gives you zero, okay? Because this momentum is exactly canceled out by this momentum. P final, we can do something similar. We have MA, VA prime plus MB VB prime. Now what's happening here is um, the objects just move in the opposite direction after collision with the same speed that they started with. So for instance, for VA prime, I would just have to flip this to negative one meter per second I hat. And similarly for uh, VB prime, I would flip this to positive one meter per second I hat. But it's really the same result, that this momentum uh, going in the negative direction cancels out this momentum going in the positive direction. And that's really just a general feature of this sort of situation where you have two objects, same mass, but moving in opposite directions at the same speed. Their momentum vectors cancel out. So in every single one of these cases, there is zero momentum because those vectors cancel out. So if we start with zero momentum and we end with zero, then momentum is always conserved. Okay, so that's really just true of all the examples. I just will show it for the first one. Okay, so for the first example, we can also calculate a kinetic energy in the initial state. And that's gonna be one half m a v a squared plus one half m b v b squared. Let's put in the numbers. Um, we have a half, we have a kilogram for m a. Now when we say v a in the kinetic energy equation, it's not a vector, it's, a, it's just the speed. Kinetic energy does not have a direction like momentum does. So with momentum, I can have you know two different momentum vectors cancel each other out just like this because they're going opposite ways. Kinetic energy doesn't work like that. It's not a vector, so you can't have one kinetic energy cancel another kinetic energy out. They just always add together. So we have one meter per second for the speed of object A starting off. And we also have uh, the same exact term, one half times a kilogram. VB has the speed of one meter per second, and we square that starting off. Okay, so the math here isn't too hard, it's a joule. So the initial kinetic energy is a joule. Now the final kinetic energy, what we would do is take a half, ma va prime squared plus a half, mb 
VB prime squared. Now I'm not even going to bother putting the numbers in here because it's the exact same thing as before. Object A started with a speed of one meter per second. It still has a speed of one meter per second after collision. Object B, same deal, still has a speed of one meter per second after collision in the first example. So this comes out the exact same way we get a joule. So because nothing has slowed down with the same kinetic energy before and after. On the other hand, uh, so that's just the first example. If we look at the second one, we can go through this whole song and dance again to calculate initial and final momentum, but here's what that's going to come out to. It's conserved. It's zero before. It's zero after. The initial kinetic energy is the same because um, in these three examples, everything starts off moving the same way. It's just after collision when things change. So we still have a joule of kinetic energy to start off. But the final kinetic energy is now going to be different. So how do we calculate a final kinetic energy? It's a half ma, which is one kilogram, va prime. Now in the second example, uh, the speed was not a meter per second, but it was a half of a meter per second. So that goes in for va prime. And the same is true for vb prime. It's moving at a half a meter per second after collision. So one half mv squared, for each one of these, when we add them together, it actually gives us only 0.25 joules. So that means we've lost, if we started with one joule of kinetic energy and we end up with 0.25, then we've lost 0.75 joules of kinetic energy. That's true of the second example. Now in the third example, You know, we don't even really need to show this um, by plugging things in. Intuitively, if nothing is moving at the end, then you don't have any kinetic energy. So K final is equal to zero, meaning we've lost everything. We've lost one joule of kinetic energy. Okay, so that's where those numbers on the slide came from. That's how you do this sort of calculation. And so next time, we're going to talk about this a lot more on um, how in certain collisions we uh, conserve kinetic energy. We have the same amount of kinetic energy before and after the collision happens. Other cases, that's not true. We lose kinetic energy. So we really want to distinguish these two cases, figure out how they're mathematically different, and that will be uh, what we start with next time. So in the meantime, everybody uh, be safe out there, stay healthy, 